Um, welcome each and every one of you. It's wonderful to have a strong, lively turnout. To those of you joining on Zoom, welcome as well. Judging by the last two days, we have an amazing <laughs> evening ahead of us, thanks to Rabbis Sandy and Dennis. Um, and of course, we are here for the capstone finale of this Shabbaton weekend. And in particular, this is the occasion of the 2024 Elka Klein Memorial Lecture. Over the past three days, Rabbi Sandy and Dennis, we have soaked up your insightful, inspiring, creative, and somehow even optimistic uh, interpretations and, and guidance to us about uh, Judaism and Reconstructionism. I'll add that, for me at least, and I imagine for many of us, you've also enriched our understanding of our Rabbi Tina's remarkable path to this pulpit here at Darche Noam from Kiev via Indianapolis. <laughs> Rabbi Tina speaks of you both often and so warmly in this sanctuary. It's been very nice for us to put faces and spirits to those <clears throat> invocations from Rabbi Tina. Um, and uh, to sort of concretize um, the wonderful things that Rabbi Tina has uh, said about you both so often. Uh, so thank you for inspiring a young refugee from Kyiv in the Ukraine to embrace her Judaism and the rabbinate. We are in your debt for that and for many other things as we've experienced over the last couple of days. Um, soon, I'll be saying a few words about the format for tonight's session, but first, we acknowledge the land that we are on. And I'm very pleased to call on our Rabbi Ryan Leshner for this. Rabbi Ryan, over to you. Good evening, everyone. Such a treat to get to see some. Hi, Ziva. Hi. It's always nice when someone gives you a wave. When you, get, when you give a wave to me, I give you a name shout out. How about that? It's a good thing. It's a pleasure to be able to be here. Uh, wonderful words of wisdom to come. Uh, here at Congregation Darche Noam in all of Toronto, we are located on indigenous land. We are in the traditional dish with one spoon territory. And this territory, the dish with one spoon, was a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Other indigenous peoples, Europeans, and all subsequent newcomers were invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, in friendship, and in respect. And sadly, this indigenous generosity of spirit was not reciprocated. And so we recognize and acknowledge the grave wrongdoings that colonialism has done to these indigenous peoples. The recent discoveries of unmarked graves at residential schools has disturbed and deepened Canadian awareness of the toll taken. We call on governments and leaders to implement and adopt fully the Truth and Reconciliations Commission's calls to action and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And as a faith community, as people who are committed to tikkun olam and doing acts of righteousness, acts of chesed, we commit ourselves to contributing to truth and reconciliation and justice for all. Rabbi Ryan, thank you for those heartfelt, uh, important words to get us uh, grounded, literally, in this, in this space and land and uh, territory. Um, and just before I call on Rabbi Tina to introduce Rabbi Sandy and Dennis, let me say a few very quick words about our format tonight. Our topic tonight is Judaism for the 21st century, a reconstructionist approach. That's not exactly a softball lob to our uh, <laughs> invitees and guests for their last at-bat performance here on the BIMA. Uh, they've got a big, significant, weighty topic, and we're really, really looking forward to what you will be sharing uh, with us. Following their presentation, we will have a Q&A session. 
uh, on your seats or you have personally been handed perhaps uh, an index card um, throughout the evening, feel free to jot down any questions you may have and they'll be collected following the presentations. Um, and for those of you who are on Zoom, please use the chat function to submit your questions at any time. Sylvia Hunter, our president, will be monitoring them and will be posing them to our guests and honorees. And um, sometime between 9 and 9.15, if you're wondering about our time frame, we expect to be wrapping up and heading downstairs to the social hall for um, uh, reception, snacks, informal conversation. And now I'm very, very pleased to call on our rabbi, Tina Grimberg, to invoke the memory of Elka Klein. Uh, whom we honor with this stellar, stellar annual lecture series. And then Rabbi Tina will introduce Rabbi Sandy and Rabbi Dennis Sasso. I was not uh, fortunate to know Elka personally, but Elka's photograph, looking at me with a shining smile, and her parents' remembrance of her brought her spirit into my study and tonight here to the sanctuary. She was effervescent, bright, kind, and devotional. If I could, I would have been honored to call her my friend. Elka of Blessed Memory was a medieval historian specializing in medieval Jewish Spain. In the Spain in which Jews lived and worked among their neighbors in peace and with some security. She was interested in how Jews lived, as it were, in two worlds. Darhei Noam was her first synagogue. The first rabbis, really the first face of Judaism she encountered, were the women rabbinical students who served our fledgling congregation. The community was of necessity largely lay-led and conviction fully, fully egalitarian. And that spoke to Elka. She was encouraged post bat mitzvah to organize and participate in services. Elka continues to do just that wherever her life and professional career took her. Her early education was in Toronto schools and continued at Yale and Harvard. At the time of her death, only 39, she was an assistant professor in the Jewish studies department of the University of Cincinnati. She had one book published and another at the press and was planning a new line of research. She also had two young children. As she put it, writes her mother, she was an American in Canada and Canadian in the United States and a Jewish woman everywhere. Elka's family felt that it's appropriate that she is remembered and remembered here where her passion for Jewish life began by the study of Jewish life in all its manifestation. Elka Klein, Zechrana Levercha. We dedicate this session of learning to her memory. In a place of sorrow, you put joy of learning. And it is both joy and honor to be able to read a short 
biographies of my dear friends and uh, mentors. Sandy Eisenberg Sasso is the first woman to have been ordained a rabbi in Reconstructionist Judaism. Rabbi Sasso was ordained by Reconstructionist College in Philadelphia on May 19, 1974. She is also the author of many children's books on religious topics. A prolific writer, Rabbi Sandy has written a number of Jewish children's books. Rabbi Sandy is a winner of National Jewish Book Award and 2018 recipient of the Eugene and Marilyn Glick Indiana Authors Award, winning Publishers Weekly Best Book of the Year Award and for But God Remembered, Stories of Women from Creation to the Promised Land and A Prayer for the Earth in 1995 and 1996, respectively. She has also written resources for parents and a book of Midrash. As of 2014, Rabbi Sandy is a director of the Religion, Spirituality, and the Arts Initiative at Butler University in Indianapolis. She also works with her cohort of fellow first women rabbis from Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox movements speaking about their experiences. Rabbi Sasso is a past president of the Reconstructionist Rabbinical Association, Gleaner's Food Bank, and a past chair of the Spirit and Place Festival. She serves on numerous boards, including Indiana Humanities Council and the co-founder of Women for Change Indiana. Rabbi Sandy has been honored as one of the influential women in Indiana by the Indianapolis Business Journal and was featured among India's most influential clergy by New World News Weekly. She's a recipient of Sagamore of the Vabash Touchstone Award from Girls Incorporated, Heritage Keeper Award from Indiana State Museum, and a Spirit of the Prairie Award from Kana Prairie Interactive Park. Rabbi Sandy received her BA and MA from Temple University and her Doctor of Ministry from the Christian Theological Seminary. I want to say that it gives me great pleasure to recite the word Indiana and Indianapolis over and over again as I'm reading this for on a map of, uh, of you know, of an America, of North America. It's just a little center, you know, of uh, which, you know, I remember as the new immigrant was hard kind of to locate, to identify. <laughs> Rabbi Dennis Sasso earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in Near Eastern and Judaic Studies from Brandeis University. He holds Master of Arts in religion from Temple University, Philadelphia, and was ordained as a rabbi by the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College, also in Philadelphia. Rabbi Sasso has also studied at Hebrew University in Jerusalem and completed his doctoral studies at Temple University and Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis, Indiana, where he obtained his Doctor of Ministry degree. Rabbi Sasso is a recipient of Doctor of Divinity degree uh, honoris causa from the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in 1999 and Christian Theological Seminary in 2000. Rabbi Sasso is a member of various scholarly and academic societies. He has served on numerous interface civic and community boards and agencies. Rabbi Dennis is currently the chairman of the Indianapolis Board of Rabbis and past president of Reconstructionist Rabbinic Association. He's also past president of the Indiana Interreligious Commission of Human Equality and was co-chairman of the Race Relations Leadership Network of the Greater Indianapolis Progress Committee. Rabbi Dennis serves as a co-chairman of the Citizens Complaint Working Group. I love this name. We should adopt it. Another committee, please. Uh, <laughs> A committee appointed by the mayor to review and make recommendations to upgrade the ordinance and regulates the uh, civilian policy review process. Rabbi Dennis presently serves as the board of directors of the Hispanic Center as well as the Jewish Federation of Greater Indianapolis. I am sure, oh my goodness, there's two more paragraphs, so stay here. <laughs> Rabbi Sasso writes, monthly column. No, I'm going to do it all because I didn't do it at the beginning of the your weekend. And we all should know 
the treasure which you've already assessed we possess here. So I'm going to test all of you at the, at the dessert if you can hold on to this. Rev. Rides monthly focus on faith in the OP page of Sunday edition of Indianapolis uh, Star. He's the member of Publications Committee of the Rabbinic Assembly and Advisory Board of Reconstructionist Journal of Contemporary Jewish Thought and Practice. Rabbi Sasso has lectured nationally and abroad and has published scholarly and, pop and popular articles on Caribbean Jewry, Reconstructing Ju Judaism, the Jewish family, life cycle, spiritual, and liturgy. He has decorated as a sagamore of the Bobash, a distinguished citizen of work presented by the governor of the state of Indiana. <laughs> Rabbi Dennis is a recipient of Community Service Award from, from the NAT the Fostering Life Award of the Indianapolis Chapter of Links in recognition of his leadership in interface and interracial relations. Uh, Rabbi Sandy and Rabbi Dennis is the first husband and wife rabbinic couple in Jewish history. They are recipient of an award for enrichment of Judaism, the family, and the rabbinate from B'nai B'ris Women's Organization and I barely touched the surface. <laughs> Rabbi Sandy and Rabbi Dennis, please enlighten us. These are hungry souls on fire. You are inflating our egos and <laughs> making uh, this moment uh, increasingly uh, difficult to, to arise to. So uh, I want to welcome all of you. I want to welcome those who join us by Zoom. When we started making uh, our services and congregational programs uh, Zoom during uh, the COVID uh, years, I instituted an award for the best program. I called it the Zuma Cum Laude. <laughs> so I, I hope that this will arise uh, to that expectation. Thank you, Meyer. Where are you for that uh, kind introduction? Um, Sandy and I have been introduced in many ways, uh, most of the time correctly as the first rabbinical couple in world Jewish history. Once we were introduced as the first couple in Jewish history. <laughs> to which I said, meet Eve. <laughs> and uh, she introduced me as, as Adam. Um, this is a profoundly meaningful uh, moment for us. We are honored to deliver the Elka Klein Zichrona Livracha Memorial Lecture this evening. We're deeply grateful to Suzanne and Martin for the invitation to speak on a topic of great significance to the Kleins and to the rabbis and leaders of Congregation Darche Noam and personally to us. Uh, we extend our blessings to of shalom to uh, Elka's beloved husband, Yossi, and children, Adina and Shaul, uh, who are not with us tonight, uh, but whom we look forward to greeting at some time in person. Delighted that Moses uh, is uh, here with us. Uh, our hearts are with you, and I know that Elka lives in your hearts as a constant blessing. Elka was a passionate person about Judaism, its vitality, its traditions, its inclusivity, its compelling relevance, and its continuity. She was raised in the matrix of this Reconstructionist congregation wherein Suzanne and Marty have played such defining roles. And we have been moved to learn about Elka from her parents and inspired by reading a scented flower, the memoir written by the family, and uh, learned how Elka modeled a robust, intellectually informed, 
emotionally engaged and spiritually alive Judaism. These are the values at the core of Reconstructionist Judaism about which uh, Sandy and I will speak tonight. And tonight is the capstone, uh, has been said, of what has been for Sandy and me a most, most meaningful Shabbaton experience with this wonderful congregation. We have had an enriching, de decades-long, personal and collegial, rewarding relationship with your beloved Rabbi Tina Greenberg. And uh, it has been a pleasure to meet Rabbi Ryan Lesner, who brings wonderful gifts of mind and heart to the congregation. We're grateful to Carol uh, Garson and the Adult Education Committee for the detailed arrangements and the warm hospitality of this weekend. Uh, and uh, don't know uh, how many other people served in the committee, but we have had an opportunity to interact with so many of you, so uh, hate to mention and, and exclude, but uh, to Aggie and Dawn and Linda and Jan and Phillips, Phyllis and to all who have gone out of their way uh, for us and to all of you who have come to the programs and continue to come to the programs uh, to pray, to sing, to learn with this congregation that truly lives up to the meaning of its name. Congregation Darchei Noam, a congregation whose ways are pleasant. And as we sing upon returning the door scroll to the ark, Netivotecha Shalom, its pathways lead to peace. So that is what we wish for you, for the Jewish people, for Israel, and for all humanity. The title of this evening's lecture, Judaism for the 21st Century, a Reconstructionist Approach, is ominous and challenging, but it is an invitation to all of us to envision how Judaism and Reconstructionism in particular might offer a compelling vision of Jewish and human life for the next generation of Jews. We dedicate these thoughts and this exploration to the memory of Elka Klein. Uh, Jan uh, was uh, critiquing me for wearing formal attire tonight. And uh, Jan, I guess that now that I am retired from the clergy and no longer a man of the cloth, I can remove the cloak for the remainder of my presentation. <laughs> well, any engagement with Reconstructionist Judaism usually begins with uh, the teachings of Rabbi Mordecai Kaplan, the innovative teacher and thinker behind the movement. But since we are talking tonight about recon Reconstructionism for the next generation, we thought it appropriate to focus tonight on the contributions of Kaplan's primary disciple, Rabbi Ira Eisenstein, because he interpreted and made Kaplan's ideas accessible to a second generation and transform Reconstructionism from an ideology into a movement. Moreover, Ira married Kaplan's daughter, Judith, herself a moving force in the unfolding of Reconstructionism. So following my remarks on Ira, Sandy will reflect on Judith's unique contributions. Then we will offer some concluding observations, critical and hopeful, diagnostic and somewhat prescriptive about the future of Reconstructionist Judaism, but most important will be the conversation that we hope we will be able to have with all of you uh, on any topic of interest. And if there was something that happened uh, on Friday night or on Saturday morning that you didn't have a chance to pursue, uh, feel free to raise those issues as well. So let me begin uh, with a few words about Rabbi Ira Eisenstein. We Jews have been called a people of the book. You know who gave us that name? Muhammad. Jews and Christians are called the peoples of the books because Islam received the scriptures and then the, the term was, ex, was extended. Uh, but as 
Rabbi Tina observed yesterday with reference to Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, as much as ours is a literary tradition, it is also a legacy of teachers and of mentors. We are shaped not only by text books, but by text people. And I have forgotten of much that I learned during my years of formal education, but I will never forget the impact of special role models, preeminent among them, Rabbi Ira Eisenstein. Ira Eisenstein was born in Harlem, New York in 1906. He studied at Columbia College and was ordained by the Jewish Theological Seminary, where he came under the mentorship of Rabbi Mordecai Menachem Kaplan. Ira helped to popularize and to propagate Kaplan's thought and made it possible for it to find institutional expression in American Jewish life. He was the editor of the Reconstructionist Journal, the president of the Jewish Reconstructionist Foundation and of the Federation of Reconstructionist Congregations and Fellowships, or Chavurot. Ira was the visionary founder and first president of the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College, where Sandy and I met and were married at the end of our first year of studies. But beyond being a scholar and a movement builder, Ira Eisenstein was a mensch. If Ira's mind came under the spell of Mordecai Kaplan, it was Judith, Kaplan's daughter, who captured his heart. Judith served as musical director at my first congregation, the Reconstructionist Synagogue of the North Shore in Long Island, where upon ordination, I served as Ira's associate rabbi. At the same time, Sandy served as the first rabbi of the Manhattan Reconstructionist Chavura, a congregation that was launched in 1974 by several of Kaplan's disciples and family members from the Society for the Advancement of Judaism. For Ira, Judaism was not an abstract idea. Judaism begins with the Jewish people. Religion is a human social reality. As Kaplan and Ira would say, belonging precedes believing. Rabbi Eisenstein developed Kaplan's notion of Judaism as the evolving religious civilization of the Jewish people. With religion at its core, Judaism as a civilization includes a rich history, law, languages, literature, music, the arts, ritual, folkways, ethics, spiritual ideals, aesthetic values. Judaism is neither static nor monolithic. It is dynamic, it is culturally and ethnically diverse and pluralistic, it is rooted in tradition but responsive to change. As Kaplan would say, the past has a vote but not a veto. Rabbi Eisenstein challenged us as young rabbinic students not just to learn but also to unlearn certain assumptions about religion. While many still subscribe to the notion that God supernaturally revealed the Torah to Israel, Eisenstein following Kaplan reversed the equation and said that the people Israel in our quest for God create Torah. Torah is a human document. It is not only a set of answers, but as we deliberated during Torah study yesterday, a series of questions. Torah is the earliest record of our people's ongoing quest for God. It is not the last word. It is the first word of a conversation that endures. While in the history of the Jewish people, belief in God has remained a constant, the conception of God has varied. And Eisenstein invites us to understand God not in supernaturalistic, but naturalistic terms, as following Kaplan, and I quote, the power which makes for life, for creativity, for freedom, for peace, in short, for the fulfillment of what human beings have come to recognize as the legitimate aspirations of mankind, 
end quote. He writes, and I quote again, we cannot picture God, we cannot picture goodness. It is not a being. It is like a force, like electricity. Nobody saw electricity, but we know it exists. We know electricity by what it does. In the same way, we get to know God by what God makes us do. Continue the quote. If we believe that life is worthwhile, that it is good, that in spite of sickness and accidents, in spite of poverty and war, in spite of all sad and difficult conditions in the world, that the world is a wonderful place and can be made better, then we believe in God." End quote. So Eisenstein, like Kaplan, affirmed the unity and the uniqueness of the Jewish people, not through the concept of chosenness, but in terms of vocation. Even as we celebrate our uniqueness as Jews, we understand that God does not play favorites. God's universe is diverse, pluralistic, inclusive, and expansive. Heaven, metaphorically speaking, is not a gated or segregated community. Ira disdained artificiality. He wore his rabbinate naturally. He would comfortably remove his jacket. He assured me that in my career as a rabbi, I would receive both criticism and praise. And he counseled me not to allow the former to weaken my ego, nor the latter to inflate it. He said, and I quote, you'll know when you have done the right thing. Ira was passionate about Judaism, but he faced situations with equanimity. He sought equilibrium between the professional and the human dimensions of the rabbinate, between the ideal needs of the Jewish people and the practical realities of the community of Israel. Whatever Sandy or I would ask him a question about how to deal with a difficult uh, pastoral situation that required a certain uh, direction or judgment, he would say to us, people have it hard enough. As rabbis, we are not supposed to make it harder for them. Ira developed Kaplan's notion of living in two civilizations, the ancestral Jewish heritage and the democratic values of North America, Canada, the United States, of Western civilization. His was not an uncritical patriotism, but a belief that was grounded in the values of democracy as a spiritual force that transcends and unifies our diverse ethnic and religious cultures. Ira understood that religions can be good or bad. And like H. Richard Niebuhr, he believed, and I quote, this is one of my favorite religious quotes, religion makes good people better and bad people worse. That's Richard Niebuhr, like Ira. Ira died in 2001 at the age of 94. Sandy and I were privileged to visit and correspond with him till near the end, as did many of his disciples and colleagues. His lucidity and his clarity of mind never left them. He shunned what he called metaphysical hair splitting to explain God's role in the world. And he said, I am not concerned about saving God's reputation for omnipotence or goodness. My theology does not call for this kind of apologetics. God is the name we attach to those powers in nature and in humanity, which make for harmony and growth, for interdependence and self-realization, for the polar values of cooperation and individualization. And I quote here from his last book. It's called Reconstructing Judaism, an autobiography that he published just a few years before he died. A personal excursus through the American Jewish experience of his lifetime and the values of Reconstructionist Judaism. 
And that's a book that I invite you all to read, Ira Eisenstein's biography. Ira lamented that religions are so often muddled by unrealistic supernaturalist concerns. He wrote, and I quote again, speculation concerning ultimate things is a pleasant occupation, but there is work to be done. And that work presupposes that there is potential there. That is the simple faith on which I have based my life, end quote. He believed that it is incumbent upon each generation of Jews to keep faith with future generations by committing ourselves to the unfinished agenda of making the world a safe place for the mind to grow and the spirit to flourish. And this is the pressing agenda for the Jewish people and for all peoples, to live secure and in devotion to the pursuits of freedom, of justice, and of peace. And I yield to my colleague. OK, we're going to come back and forth, so you don't have to clap each time. <laughs> Uh, just a word, um, Ira and Judith, who I'm going to talk about uh, right now, would have loved this congregation. I mean, they would have loved your Shabbat worship. And I just want to say a word of praise of you and your rabbis. Uh, it says on Shabbat that we get a Nishama Yetera, an extra soul, and it leaves us at the end of Shabbat. That's why we breathe in those wonderful spices and the light and the wine. I'm not sure it leaves you. I think this congregation has an extra soul, and we're really privileged to have been here and, and come to know you. So uh, you know that Judas was uh, Rabbi Mordecai and Lena Kaplan's eldest daughter. Uh, and he took her everywhere with him and asked her the most difficult religious questions uh, and had her study deeply Judaism. She, along with her husband, Ira Eisenstein, helped really to model for a second generation of Reconstructionist Jews the joys and the purposes of Jewish living. Now, you know that Judith was not a rabbi, but her teaching, and she taught a lot of cantors, and influence are felt in powerful and indelible ways in the unfolding of Reconstructionist Judaism. And it really was both Dennis's and my privilege to know and work closely with them over the years. So I'm going to reflect on her legacy and the impact she had on Judaism in general. So imagine over 2,000 years ago, tradition tells us that 70 men cloistered in separate rooms wrote the Greek Septuagint. So is the legend, the first rendition of the Bible into another language. They wrote that translation out of their own understanding and experience that has influenced generations of Bible readers in the West. Well, 102 years ago, in 1922, Judith Kaplan, a young girl of 12 and a half, stood in front of her congregation as no woman had stood before. She recited the blessings and read the Torah as a bat mitzvah. Years later, Judith reflected on that day. I had mixed feelings. I was certainly happy to be important, you know, but on the other hand, I was uncomfortable. When you're 12 years old, you don't want to be too different. I was alone in front of the room with all the men. As I told you earlier, there was still separate seating at the Society for the Advancement of Judaism. Mom was far away from me. I had to talk loud, and I had to say every syllable. What began that day with the determination of a young girl and the vision of her father, Rabbi Mordecai Kaplan, became a revolution in religious creativity for women and for all of Judaism. We are still unwrapping that gift. 
Now, I had the privilege of speaking at the 70th anniversary of Judah's bat mitzvah. I think, Phyllis, you were there. Do you remember my talk? No. Good. Because I'm good. <laughs> I may my remember some of that. <laughs> so on that occasion, in March 1992, 70 women, remember the 70 men in the Septuagint? The 70 women, many whom had by that time become rabbis and Jewish leaders, came together in New York to honor Judith and to offer their own understanding and their translation of Jewish life, just as 70 men had done through their Greek Bible translation. Since Judah's historic bat mitzvah, Jewish women have created ceremonies, told stories, developed and enlivened rituals in the tradition of Sarah and Abraham who celebrated Isaac's weaning, in the tradition of our ancestors who taught a new generation not to sit in darkness but to light Sabbath candles, in the tradition of the rabbis who told the Hanukkah story for succeeding generations, not as a military, but as a spiritual victory. Let me uh, take a moment to unpack that sentence, because there's a lot in there. OK, there were no weaning rituals when Abraham and, uh, and Sarah decided to make one. They created it. It wasn't tradition. The Bible tells us we should not light a fire on the Sabbath. We talked about that in, in study. It says, don't light a fire. If you light candles, you're not following the Torah. It was a later generation that disagreed with the priests and said, oh, Shabbat is a day of joy and celebration. We shouldn't sit in the dark. The rabbis disagreed with the priests and told us to light candles. And that is what we do today. That is our practice, a change in tradition. The original Hanukkah story was about a military victor. Victory, no mention of that candle and the eternal light lasting for eight, eight days. Not in the original story. Um, it is only later that the rabbis invented the story of the flask of oil lasting for eight days. Yes, there, there, there is no tooth fairy. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so they, they could turn the message of Hanukkah into Zechariah's hope, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And that's how we observe the holiday today. So in the name of all those who went before us, and in the name of generations yet to come, we preserved and we innovated. We marveled at how much remained the same in our cycles of time, what ancient words still moved us, and yet we took note of how different we are and what silences needed still to be broken. What mattered was that we imagined ourselves not just as descendants, but also as ancestors who bequeathed our spiritual quest to the next generation. So as Jewish women, we accepted this awe-filled responsibility with a deep sense of humility. After all, I mean, who are we, tied as we are to our particular time and place, to fashion sacred words and create the holy drama to carry us through the passage of years? An awesome responsibility. But we also respected this responsibility with a strong sense of duty. After all, who are we? Bearers of the image of the divine, not to pour our souls into the crucible of time, to affix our name to the holy narrative of our people. Humility and audacity. Humility and audacity. Judah's contribution did not end with that bat mitzvah event. She continued to make Jewish history. As an accomplished musicologist, she taught and inspired generations of cantors 
to appreciate the vast diversity of Jewish music. She published the first Jewish songbook for children and created educational materials and performing materials where none had existed before. She upheld her father's standards of religious and intellectual integrity. So some of you may know this, some of you may not. You know the popular Hanukkah song, Oh Hanukkah, Oh Hanukkah, Come Light the Menorah? You sing Judas lyrics, not the original lyrics. And what did she do? Um, she changed the verse of praise that said, for the miracles and wars that God fought on our behalf. She did not like that. It was not Kaplanian theology. She changed that line to what we now sing. Light one for each night, they shed a sweet light to remind us of days long ago. She shifted the supernatural miracle to human memory and responsibility. The whole Jewish world sings that. This is at the heart of what it means to be a Reconstructionist Jew. When our intellect contradicted our traditional theology, we reimagined new ways of understanding God. From a power over us to a force that empowers us. From what God can do to us or for us to what we can do because of God. From the image of God as a being to a godly way of becoming. When ritual lost its aesthetic and the spark that once ignited it, we transformed and invigorated old forms with new spirit. We, Reconstructionist Jews, created the first covenantal birth ceremony for girls. Actually, Dennis and I did that together. <laughs> I bet you do that. Everybody does that today. We added the matriarchs to the first blessing of the Amida in our ordination ceremony, 1974. These are Reconstructionist contributions. We were honored that Judah spoke to our daughter, Debbie, when she became a bat mitzvah 32 years ago. She said to Debbie that Judaism should always be a joy for her. And it was in that spirit that Reconstructionists turned rote practice into meaningful celebration. And we imagine that is what Elka and her family found here at Dar Chay Noam, a fully egalitarian Judaism, intellectually credible and joyful. So we think, uh, Dennis mentioned this, I think, during his Devar Torah yesterday, but Reconstructionists have three categories by which we judge what comes next. It has to be intellectually credible, it has to be aesthetically pleasing, and it has to have moral integrity. So when traditions contradicted our ethics, we reconstructed customs to embody moral sensibility. We were among the first to welcome the LGBTQ community into the synagogue and into the rabbinate. We innovated a female-initiated egalitarian get a Jewish divorce. Reconstructionism understood that Judaism would fail if it responded to modernity by emphasizing religion alone. It contributed to the 20th century the understanding of Judaism as a civilization, alive with language and music and art dance and history and literature, sacred texts and community. The creativity that marked Reconstructionist thinking inspired and soared because it had a tether, a past to which it was attached, and a depth in which it was immersed without being dragged down by it. 
Judaism's encounter with feminism offers us a lesson. We did not abandon Judaism for feminism. We built a bridge. We did not set a completely new table. We pulled up a seat to tradition's table and rearranged some of the table settings. We did not abandon the texts past. We reinvigorated. The past didn't have a veto, but it did have a vote. We juggled between being descendants, receivers of rich tradition, and being ancestors, shapers, and transmitters of a new spiritual heritage. Our audacity mingled with our humility. Humility without audacity is submissiveness. Audacity without humility is arrogance. We have to guard against both. There was a recent article that suggested that the central metaphor we use for Jewish culture today is journey. In Jewish life, we have, in fact, created more individualized experiences to attract an increasing number of young seekers. The metaphor of journey is compelling. It encourages exploration, celebrates the allure of whatever is new. It feels right to rejoice in the excitement and learning and experience of novel ideas. And we all love to travel. But let us remember that the reason we enjoy our leave taking so much is that there is a place for us to come home to. In recent months, many of us have felt rejected or misunderstood by communities to which we thought we belonged. What we have sought is not another journey, but a place to call home, where others share our grief, and we are accepted for who we are. So the question is, can we create a Jewish homecoming for the next generation? And what will it take? The question used to be, how do I fit in as a Jew? It's not the question anymore. The question now is, why should it matter that I am a Jew? Why should I care if I have a Jewish home? And if I want to come, where's the door? A little bit more. You know, when you have a lot to say and a limited time to say it, you feel a little bit like an Egyptian mummy pressed for time. I told him not to do it. I'm going to try to unpack a little bit what uh, Sandy um, uh, began to. Um, to hone into. Sandy and I were ordained as part of the RRC second commencement, the class of 1974. Back in the late 60s and early 70s, ours was an idealistic Hevra, animated by a spirit of daring and innovation, who had chosen a maverick school for rabbinic training. We were inspired by a love of the Jewish people and its religious civilization by a commitment to Zionism as an expression of those values, by dedication to Judaism in the key of religious naturalism that we have uh, been explaining. We were universalists in outlook, but we entered the universal from our particularity as Jews. These were the values and the premises upon which we, the early graduates of the college, founded the Reconstructionist Rabbinical Association in December of 1974 in a classroom at Knesset Israel Congregation in Philadelphia, nine of us from 
the rabbinical seminary with Rabbi Ira Eisenstein and our host, Rabbi Bertram Korn. Some of you may have heard some of this during my Torah Yovel, if you listen to that program, um, celebration of our 50th anniversary. But I bring it in because I think it'll open the door to a conversation that we might have. Today, there is a deep feeling among many graduates and students of the RRC that these values of Jewish peoplehood, of Zionism, of religious naturalism, of a civilizational understanding of the Judaism that Rabbi Kaplan and his disciples inspired and modeled, these are no longer the core components of the culture of the college and among many in the movement at large. And this is a trend that is also noticeable as I think we pointed out on Friday evening among other um, liberal seminaries. Certainly, Reconstructionism is about evolution and renewal. But even as we breathe new ideas and bring new concerns into the movement, we would be diminished if we fail to honor and to renew the rich heritage of Rabbis Kaplan and Rabbi Ira Eisenstein and Rabbi Jack Cohen, who labored in Israel uh, for Reconstructionism, Rabbi Eugene Cohen, Rabbi Milton Steinberg, beloved rabbi. He was the first rabbi of our congregation in Indianapolis, by the way, Milton Steinberg, and other founders of Reconstructionism. The movement that was inspired by these luminaries who helped to shape not only Reconstructionism, but modern North American Judaism is now accepting and graduating students with little commitment to the civilizational peoplehood and philosophic values that have historically identified Reconstructionist Judaism. A handful of pro-Israel students currently enrolled at the Rabbinical College confess to experiences, to experiencing an uncomfortable environment of anti-Zionist sentiment. Some are leaving while others are considering discontinuing their program of instruction or transferring to another institution. Several students and colleagues have expressed concern that the college has de-emphasized its role uh, primarily as a rabbinical academy for the training of rabbis to serve the Reconstructionist movement, to serve Reconstructionist congregations or congregations as a whole, and instead has become a center for the teaching and training of a certain type of far left political social activism. Theologically and philosophically, I worry that the compelling ideas of religious naturalism that Kaplan and Eisenstein uh, promoted have given way among some rabbis to a new age religiosity of privatized, episodic, soft spirituality. In the meantime, some new reconstruction, some, some of Reconstructionism's best ideas are being co-opted by rabbis and other movements interested in religious naturalism and process theology, but they do not typically transmit or even recognize the Reconstructionist source of those teachings. We need to refill and to drink from our own vessels. I sense a worrisome loss of institutional memory among many current leaders and younger students and rabbis in the movement. There is a sense of distancing on the part of many congregations who were significant in the early stages of the movement uh, in terms of their connection to the uh, movement as a whole. We are at an inflection point in the history of American and indeed worldwide Judaism, North American, Western Judaism. Reconstructionism was the movement, as Sandy said, that developed the vocabulary of Jewish peoplehood and stood in solidarity with the people and the state of Israel. It exemplified how to be pro-Zionist, pro-Israel, and pro-peace. It modeled with pride and conviction a religion of ethical nationhood. That was the title of Rabbi Kaplan's last book, Judaism, the Religion of Ethical Nationhood. Though numerically small, the Reconstructionist movement was perceived as the think tank, the brain trust, the workshop that fueled creative ideas and best practices and organic purposes 
for North American Judaism. We need to reaffirm that ground. We need to reach out to the margins, but we need to be heedful not to become marginal. So this is kind of the hard part of, of the speech, but I want to tell you as a children's author, you can't end a children's book on a sad note. That has, so just stay with us a little longer and we'll, we'll end on something positive. So North American Judaism is in turmoil. Congregations are merging, rabbinical seminaries are closing, a strong sense of community is eroding in favor of privatism. Rationalism is in decline. Civil and human rights are being challenged. And as you know, Israel's very existence is being questioned. There is a growing decentralization in Jewish life. We are becoming a conglomerate of privatized communities. There are so many other fellowships to join. Many do not feel the need of Jewish gatherings to fulfill their quest for relationships or for meaning. Our unified, our unifying agenda is fraying. Look, in the 20th, 20th century, we were united by our need to respond to the Holocaust by the miracle of Israel's rebirth, by the efforts to rescue oppressed Jewry from the Soviet Union, from Ethiopia, and other endangered Jewish communities. What binds us today? What unites us? In Mordecai Kaplan's diagram of Judaism, which Dennis spoke about also, um, yesterday, I believe. Israel was the hub, and the diaspora communities were the outer rim of the wheel, united by spokes of culture, religion, and ethics. Today, the Jewish population of Israel is larger than the combined world diaspora communities. Once the United States was the, indicated the most Jews, that is not the case anymore. Israel has more Jews than the United States. Meant to unify and protect us, Israel has become, for many younger Jews, a point of conflict and contention. Anti-Semitism, which we naively believe had been eliminated in the free world, has resurfaced, not only on the right, but in the very places where we had made our homes and built coalitions the university, and the social justice community. The concept of the big tent had been at the heart of the Reconstructionist idea. Our movement is pluralistic, inclusive, and accepting in principle and in practice. We were inspired by the prophet Isaiah who taught, enlarge the space of your tent. Stretch the curtains of your habitation. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. The last phrase is essential to the project. As the ropes are lengthened to enlarge the tent, the stakes need to be driven deeper into the ground. The tent has many ways to enter but it is upheld by strong poles of identity, peoplehood, community, a credible theology, ethical values, cultural and tradition, intellect and spirit, Hebrew and the many languages and literatures of our people, mores and sancta, Zion and diaspora, memory and hope. Upon these stretches the protective and welcoming canvas of the evolving religious civilization. Rabbi Eisenstein would remind us that the Reconstructionist project is human, but its language is Jewish.
I get the privilege of the closing remarks, but you will have the last word. So the challenge before us is to recapture that universal agenda without abdicating the particularist values that inform, preserve, and adorn our evolving religious civilization. The question before is, question before us, is how to live and to transmit a vital, joyful, intellectually coherent, morally compelling, and spiritually nourishing Reconstructionist Judaism or Judaism to the next generation of North American Jews. We often quote Kaplan's iconic saying, tradition has a vote, but not a veto. That does not mean anything goes. Being post-halachic is not an endorsement of antinomianism or permissive Sabbateanism. We talk about that. It does not mean abdicating standards as we do the creative work of personalizing and contemporizing ceremony and ritual as Jewish feminism modeled a generation ago. Let us be attentive to the collective experiences and practices that have bound us through time and space. Let us strive not for customized religion, but for unifying custom. As we nurture our personal spirituality, the need to find mystery in the mundane and renewal in the stagnant, let us not lose touch with a Judaism that is historically tested and intellectually coherent. Reconstructionism understands Judaism as the evolving religious civilization of the Jewish people. That means that it is unfinished. The ancient rabbis taught, lo alecha hamlacha ligmor. It is not your responsibility to finish the task. Velo ben horim, but you are not free to desist from it. I sense a renewed urgency and energy among senior and younger rabbinic and lay leaders to reclaim core Reconstructionist values and rebuild upon them. This is a time of testing, but this is a time for embracing the best of the past and the possibilities and promise of the future. So it is for us to complete the unfinished tasks of those who came before us and to plant the hope, the seeds of hope and renewal for those who will yet come after us. And I have complete trust that that from this congregation, Torah will emerge to renew and to renew us. Thank you very much. Exhale, deep breath. Um, Rabbi Sandy and Dennis, I'm going to uh, stay with my hokey baseball analogy. Um, you replied in kind. You, you threw us a hardball. Like, this was not a kind of soft, comforting little parable talk you gave us. You really challenged us to face difficulties that the Jewish world and Reconstructionism confronts. And uh, I'm pretty confident that, uh, as, you, as you suggested, that in this room there will be any number of questions and um, observations that will deepen our understanding of a path forward. Uh, I'll be honest and say I'm not sure exactly about the choreography. We're going to work this out in real time now. I'm going to ask Linda Grusen and Jan Silverman to collect any cards that have been written. I'm going to invite Sylvia Hunter, our president. Sylvia, I th would it work best, S Sylvia, if you came up and joined me here at the podium? And we um, then invited Rabbi Sandy and Rabbi Dennis to be at the, uh, uh, the table at microphones. 
Um, Sylvia has been, f uh, has been receiving uh, questions, comments from uh, the Zoom audience. Thank you very much for that, Zoomers. Uh, so I think while we gather the cards and I get a chance to look at them, uh, um, Sylvia, over to you to, to pose the first questions that have come in online. Sure. Okay, am I audible from here? Yes. Awesome. Um, so our first question comes from our first question comes from Tina Silver, and Tina says, most of the traditional liturgy that we read and repeat does not seem to me to reflect the basic reconstructionist beliefs. Why do we repeat traditional ways of understanding if we have evolved to new ways of understanding? Let me first acknowledge and thank Sylvia, which I, <laughs> whom I failed to mention in our opening <laughs> expressions of thanksgiving. So we are grateful to you for leading this congregation and for hosting us. For two more days, two oh. more days. <laughs> Is that why you're smiling? Yes. <laughs> so we, are you, do you want to finish with the Sheikh Iyanu? Uh, <laughs> That's for Tuesday night. <laughs> So this is when we begin to roll up the sleeves. <laughs> Sorry, okay. I have not. <laughs> Liturgy, you want to talk about prayers? I, yeah. I, I will say something. Look, Reconstructionist Prayer Book did make changes in the liturgy in order to reflect some intellectual concerns. We took out chosenness. That was a huge, big. Why do you think they burned the Reconstructionist Prayer Book, right? And they put Mordecai Kaplan in Cherem because he took out chosenness. They didn't burn the reform prayer book. This is so incredible. Just remember that. So it was because we had made such significant changes to the liturgy. Now, why did we keep everything like king of the universe and all these phrases that seem to reflect a supernatural God? I think the decision was because we considered it poetry and that we considered it uh, at the core of our people's poetic and metaphoric expression, which was at the heart of their spiritual search. And while we did make some changes in the English, and I think there's a tendency today, even more English changes, there was a desire to maintain a coherent, universal liturgy that you could go to Spain or France or uh, China or anyway, and walk in a synagogue and say, I'm home. So once you, everybody starts creating their own prayers, you don't have that. So I think what um, Reconstruction has tried to do is change the things they found most offensive, okay? So the idea of resurrection of the dead, the idea of you were chosen among all people, they thought that had ethical implications and they needed to change it. The others they understood as a poetic expression of centuries of people trying to uh, speak what was in their hearts and souls. That doesn't mean you couldn't also add other poetry of this generation, and you'll notice in the Reconstructionist Prayer Book, of course it's now old, so it needs some updating. There's other expressions, other poetry that speaks the language of our generation. Do you want to say something? Yeah, and that process of uh, renewing the liturgy um, continues. It really began in the Reconstructionist movement with the Haggadah for Passover. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the first major liturgical innovation. And um, one of the big controversial changes of that period was the elimination of the recitation of the plagues, <laughs> uh, which Kaplan uh, considered to be uh, supernaturally, uh, you know, impossible, but also morally offensive. Now, what happened in the, the next generation of Reconstruction is, is that people started pasting it into the prayer book. <laughs> Why? Because how can you have a Seder without reciting the plagues and diminishing the, uh, the wine from the cups? So the process of liturgical uh, change is an ongoing uh, uh, process. The 1945 Reconstructionist Sidur, which is the one that was a uh, cause for the reason for the excommunication of Mordecai Kaplan, uh, you know, served the Reconstructionist community for several decades. And then a new prayer book, the one that you use here, of which Sandy was a member of the editorial committee, um, came out uh, and 
change some additional language, and then, as Sandy said, added contemporary readings and poetry. But the old Reconstructionist Prayer Book worked on that premise as well. If you look at the old 1945 Reconstructionist Prayer Book, about one third of it is the traditional liturgy. Two thirds of it is tosafot, additional readings, poetry, meditations, reflections, uh, written in a 1940s style. Actually, some of it very lovely. My favorite piece in that part of the prayer book and in that whole prayer book is a meditation in the back called um, by Mordecai Kaplan, one of his few poetic expressions <laughs> called God, the Life of Nature. It's a beautiful poem about how God functions in our, in our lives, metaphoric expressions. It begins, our ancestors acclaimed the God whose uh, marvels they read in the universe above. And it, then it's inspired by verses from Job. And then it goes on to see God is in the hope. God is in the life. God is in the love. And it, it's really a very beautiful reading. There is an abbreviated version of it in the, uh, in the current uh, Kol Haneshama prayer book. But the process of liturgical change is ongoing. And uh, the good thing about liturgy is that it's kind of individualized to congregations. Some congregations like more of this, some congregations like more of that. But the, at the heart is what Sandy said. Kaplan wanted to maintain, remember, peoplehood, civilization. He wanted to maintain a re recognizable core. And, and, and he then invited us to interpret some of the prayers, not literally, but metaphorically, poetically. When we say the Statue of Liberty, we don't mean that that statue is liberty. It is a symbol for something. Items like words are symbols, and then we can read into them or out of them new meanings. I should just add that um, through the, what's it, the Kaplan Center, um, Jeff Shine and I and another poet are creating a Shabbat table booklet now uh, that's going to include the, you know, the, the, to have your Shabbat at your table with the candles and the Kiddush and the tzedakah and everything. That's going to have some more contemporary. The Hebrew will probably be similar, but the translations will be more uh, in keeping with what a family would enjoy doing with some additional material. So look for that in a year or two. <laughs> and just and there is a youth prayer book that Sandy yeah, and Jeff Schein Cole, edits. Cole Hanoir. Cole Hanoir, which we just assigned. Uh, Sandy just signed for you. It's a beautiful. Actually, you should do it. I, <laughs> well. I would encourage you to do a, a Friday evening service using Sidur Kol Hanoir, because some of the wording there is to reach children. And many adults who have read it says, hey, why can't we have a prayer book like this? It's really uh, very appealing. And so it's a funny story about that prayer book, just to show you how we have compromised as Reconstructionists, too. So we, we didn't know whether to transliterate the Hebrew or not. So there was one group of Reconstructionists who says, don't you dare transliterate that. Then our students will never learn Hebrew. They will rely on, on the transliteration. OK, the other half of the Reconstructionists says, how could you not put in translation? There are adults coming to the service and they want to participate. And then I go, I, yeah, what are we going to do? So we compromise. Half of them have transliteration and half of them don't. <laughs> you choose. <laughs> Thanks very much for those comments. Um, one of my learnings, by the way, from these cards is there actually are people who have handwriting that's less decipherable than my own. So, so. This is perversely kind of comforting to me, I'll say. Uh, so I've, I've tried. <laughs> I've tried. Uh, uh, um, uh, I'll also um, try to uh, frame questions that uh, reflect common thematics to them. OK, so very con uh, uh, I'll read two in that regard. One very concisely put, one framed in a bit more broadly. Um, uh, um, one question posed was, uh, do you have ideas about how we can engage young people? Relatedly, how can we reconstruct the core message of Reconstructionism for a generation that is increasingly distant from the powerful influences of the rebirth of Israel and of the Holocaust, and also from the more traditional and nostalgic Jewish history and practices? 
That's the question. Yeah. <laughs> Want to start? I, 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 you know, that's the question that we have to ask the next generation. I mean, I, we can try to answer it, but I am not. I mean, okay, I feel young, but I am not young any longer. And I really think what we have to do is engage that generation and say, what, what, do, you look, what are you looking for? Now, I know people, uh, well, you're young people here, maybe you could answer. <laughs> <laughs> what are you looking for? <laughs> no, I, I don't want to put you on the spot. But I do think that people still yearn for community. They learn for a place that they feel safe and at home, and they can go to when they're in trouble and when they're grieving and when life is not perfect. Um, so that's one thing we need, we need to think about. Um, but I don't really have the answers. I think we have to ask a different question. What is it that will unite us today? Uh, and, ha and I think it has a lot to do with our religious education. Um, I mean, we, I think I mentioned this, we have focused, and rightly so, on tikkun olam. But we can't only have tikkun olam without talking about the values that bring us there, and the Jewish history, and tradition, and literature, and music that fills that as well. So we cannot only speak as Eisenstein had said a universal language. We have to use a Jewish language to talk about Jewish values. And I think the way in which we educate our children will probably begin to change. I, I think it'll begin to change. Uh, so I, I use an example. I know people talk a lot about spirituality and what they want, you know, is meditation and spiritual experiences, some sense of transcendence beyond the mundane. So I'd like to define the difference for you between spirituality and religion. Um, religion meaning all the customs and traditions and rituals. Um, when Moses went up to Sinai, he had a spiritual experience. You read about that, right? His face glows. You know, there's rays of light that have become Michelangelo's horns, right, on Moses. There was something transformative. Religion was the container for that experience. It was the Ten Commandments. Moses took this spiritual experience and held it within the Ten Commandments. We need both, because Sinai, without the Ten Commandments, is just another mountain. So we have to find the right containers to hold this sense of transcendence and going beyond the self. And I think that's what we need to strive to do. It's not easy, but. The questions that uh, Kaplan's and Eisenstein's generation brought to Judaism and the quests that animated them were very different from the questions and the quest of our uh, generation, especially our young people. Uh, this is a conversation that uh, I know that you as a congregation continue to have with Rabbi Tina and, and Rabbi Ryan, uh, and it's an ongoing congregation, an ongoing uh, question and conversation. The people who in that generation identified as Reconstructionist were people who felt deeply Jewish from a cultural uh, and uh, ethnic and uh, communal point of view, but had questions about the tradition's application to modernity, to their living in contemporary society questions about psychology, questions about science. So they were trying, as Maimonides did in his own generation, to make Judaism compatible with their generational uh, intellectual and emotional tone. Young people today are totally at home in America. They don't have a problem with the American experience, but they are distant from the Jewish experience. 
They don't have the body of experience, of learning, of community. So the learning that needs to take place is as um, 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 Martin Buber uh, and uh, Franz Rosenzweig tried to do for their generation. They called it a reverse learning. They had to bring the values of tradition to a generation that was distanced from, the, from, from Judaism, but felt a certain need to connect in certain ways. And I think that that's where we are in a new similar stage in American Judaism today. Uh, people are at home, they feel that social justice and rightly so, because that is a core value of Judaism, is at the heart of our identity as human beings. And that's what motivates them. And then we need to find a vessel, a Jewish language, a Jewish container, a Jewish community to allow to express that in ways that it keeps it within the, um, the community, within the experience of being Jewish rather than exports it outside. So that is the constant dialogue, I think, of the traditions, um, how, to, uh, how to evolve civilizationally and keep the balance between the Judaic and the universal, the uh, particular and the totally human. And uh, uh, it was not just Ira Eisenstein, but uh, Alan Miller, who wrote a magnificent little book, uh, he was a successor at the uh, SAJ. He wrote a book called The God of Daniel S. It was written in the 1970s, 80s. If you haven't read it, it's still very viable. Uh, and there he said, we don't speak a language in general. We speak a language in particular. Each language expresses universal values, but in the tones and grammar and vocabulary of a particular tradition. We need to now transmit a vocabulary of Judaism that will contain the aspirations, the universal aspirations of our young people, I think. Let me say something a little more, opt I mean, more optimistic than we were saying at the end of our talk. There's a lot of interest in Jewish study. I mean, all over uh, the world, and better particularly, I've just been noticing in the United States, there are like Jewish coffee houses being created where the purpose is to come have coffee and study Judaism with different scholars who come in. There is a, a thirst for Jewish knowledge. And I, I, you have to, don't give up on the next generation. There is this quest. They may want to do it in different places. They may want to gather in different yeah. ways. Uh, but they haven't given up on Judaism. They haven't given up on Judaism. They actually want to learn. And there are a lot of places where there is adult, I mean, adult, young adult Jewish learning that's taking place. <laughs> I am mindful, Sylvia and I are mindful of the time, and there is, uh, there are yummy treats downstairs that await, um, and that'll be an opportunity for us informally to ask questions. Um, maybe we'll, we'll so uh, apologies to um, uh, those who, um, uh, apologies to, to those who have asked really interesting questions that won't get raised um, public, uh, here now from the BIMA, we, but we there apologize will... for the long-winded answer. <laughs> no, 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 no. We can do some, we can do some <laughs> true and false. Uh, uh, overruled, overruled, <laughs> overruled. I think is the is the technical term. Yeah, um, uh, I'm going to go with two very very quick questions. They could go on forever as answers, but I'll, I'll pose them and you can handle them as we may, and then I will turn things over to Rabbi Tina to uh, shepherd us into uh, um, uh, the reception. So one, one question is, can we be Jewish without being committed to Zionism? Question number one. <laughs> question number two, um, is it perhaps time even overdue for all branches of Judaism to come together more to build our peoplehood, nationhood, and make it stronger in today's very unfriendly environment? Can I start with that? No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait. 
Well, I think the first question that you pose is really the question of the day. It's the question uh, that is challenging us uh, on college campuses and as a result of developments uh, in Israel right now. Uh, let me ask, begin with a historic uh, perspective. Um, there have been non-Zionist expressions of Judaism. Ultra-Orthodox Jews, the Turei Karta in Israel, who live in the land of Israel because it's holy land, are not committed to the concept of the state of Israel because they're waiting for the Messiah. So that is one perspective. In the 1920s and 30s and 40s, there was a strong contingent of American Judaism, North American Judaism, and uh, in Europe as well as a result of the Enlightenment, who were very concerned about the development of the Zionist movement and organized in the United States. There was a reform, a core reform, uh, I mean, at one point, they were probably the majority of the reform movement. It was called the American Council of Judaism, for Judaism that rejected Zionism. And uh, the majority of reform Jews, liberal Jews at that time, even if they were not members of the American Council for Judaism, were not interested in promoting the cause of organized Zionism. I mean, you shouldn't think that when Ben-Gurion and Golda Meir uh, and Albert Einstein came to the United States to talk uh, within Zionist organizations, they were welcomed or applauded by all uh, North American Jews. No, there were some who resisted. They thought that the establishment of a state of Israel would compromise the uh, security, the acceptance, uh, the universal values of modern Judaism that had been inherited from the Enlightenment. After all, what was the Enlightenment in Europe in the, in the 19th century, but an effort to bring Jews more into uh, participation and inclusion in Western society. So there have been times when non-Zionism and even anti-Zionism have been part of, uh, of, of Judaism. The issue has become particularly accentuated, I think, in, in, in contemporary times with the actual birth of the state of Israel, which was intended to be a source of solace and hope and promise and uh, security uh, for the Jewish people, right? But because for very complex reasons has in many ways uh, raised questions that uh, were not uh, anticipated or at least not hoped for. Uh, so the question arises, do we have to be Zionist to be Jews? For me, it boils down to what do you mean by not being Zionist or what do you mean by Zionism? Uh, my gut response today, when over half the world's Jews live in the state of Israel, that you can be mm, somewhat indifferent to the existence of the state of Israel. You can certainly disagree with policies of the government of the state of Israel and practices and, and you can, who are the people who most disagree with uh, the state of Israel's policies and practices? Israelis. But they're doing out of their own existential right, out of their own existential uh, commitment to the endurance of the state of Israel. So they're having an internal discussion. I think that uh, American Jews owe not allegiance to the government of the state of Israel and not necessarily a, uh, an activist, pro-Zionist stance, if you don't want it, but I think that to be anti the state of Israel not anti-particular expressions of Zionism, not anti-particular policies of the state of Israel, but to, to, to express oneself as opposed to the legitimacy, the existence, and the security of the state of Israel, I find that a very problematic stance for the modern Jew. But it is a conversation that is very real in the, in the Jewish community. And having said that, we have to be prepared to have that conversation and not ab initio uh, from the beginning read out of the Jewish community those 
who might have different, uh, different opinions on the matter. I think that we need to, um, to be a little bit, to, to try to educate one another, to as congregations, as individuals, and, and congregations have diversity within themselves. I would hope you don't all agree on everything uh, in this congregation about everything that happens, right? So there is gonna be diversity. Uh, my stance as a Jew, as a reconstructionist is, you can certainly criticize the state of Israel. You can find certain policies to be abhorrent. You can find, you, you can find uh, uh, room for different paths to peace, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and abhor certain practices of certain groups within the state of Israel. But um, I think all in all, the security of the Jewish people worldwide requires us to at least affirm and come around the, the legality of the existence of the state of Israel. Zionism means that for me, to affirm the uh, legitimacy and reality of the state of Israel. And we have to remember that Zionism was a very diverse <laughs> political exp experience and expression in the early states of the state of Israel, right? The labor, uh, read out the Likudniks, uh, 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 Ben-Gurion bombed the ship of, he of, of Heirut, right? Uh, so that exists there. The question is where do we as diaspora Jews come into this conversation? Is it legitimate for us? Is it, um, I, I would even say, at what level is it moral for us to undermine the legitimacy, legitimacy and security of over half the Jewish population of the world? In what ways can we support that without endorsing every action of any particular Israeli administration at a certain time? I agree. <laughs> you know, I, I think 7.2 million Jews live in Israel. Do you have to care about them? Yes. You know, what their security, their safety, their ex existential existence, yes. How you do that, that's another question, and, but it's uh, very important. Um, the other question was denominationalism. We are moving away from denominationalism. There's no question about that. There are really two denominations that exist today. The Orthodox, <laughs> traditional as they would say, quote unquote, and the progressives and the liberals. I mean, it's very hard to see significant differences in general. Uh, uh, among, you know, reform, reconstructionist, conservative Judaism, there is so much more in common among us than there are differences. What seemed to be different is the way in which we pray. Okay, so more Hebrew, less Hebrew, uh, different kinds of singing, what's permitted, that, that, that changes. And I think we're always, and Kaplan saw this, he had this idea of the Jewish Community Center. And he said, there'll be a bunch of different services. And some of you will like more Hebrew, some of you will want a guitar, he didn't know about that time. You know, uh, you know some of you will want this, and you'll each on you know, Shabbat, you'll go to your individual places, and then you'll come together to learn, you know, Jewish history, and do Israeli dance, and Jewish music. Uh, I think that's where we're headed. I, uh, but there are unique things of each movement that that I think are, enrich us. Just like you read different authors <laughs> and you read different poets and you learn different things from all these. So each movement, like Reconstruction, has a lot to offer. The truth is, was it Charles Silverman who said this uh, in the American Jewish Yearbook said, most Jews are Reconstructionists but don't know it. <laughs> because when we used to start talking about Reconstructionism and Reconstructionist theology, say, that's what I am. I didn't even know there was a movement about that. So all of this has intertwined. I think we will always have different kinds of service experiences because we have a different aesthetic. Um, but there is a, and, and that's part of the issue with uh, rabbinical seminaries. Now you have many seminaries that are not denominational. Just come and learn. 
So I, I think that that is changing in strong ways because the movements were a reaction to modernity. And each movement, I mean, beginning in Europe, was to say, how do I live as a citizen of this country and still be Jewish? And what happened mostly was, well, we're going to talk, we'll be religious. Why? Because then we fit into the plurality. Remember this book by Will Herberg, uh, was it Christ, uh, Catholic, Protestant. Catholic, Protestant, Jew? Well, we're not like Catholics and Protestants, but we needed to be to get to fit into America. So we fit into that category. Uh, now we're seeing we don't have to do that anymore. That's not a great way to end. There must be a better way. <laughs> uh, better. Uh, OK, I have a better way to end. I'm sorry. So I'll tell you this little story. Um, you know, uh, when Adam and Eve uh, ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, uh, and God was going to send them out of the garden, God, so they did it on, they were created on Friday, sixth day, and they also ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil on the sixth day. It didn't take them long to disobey. Okay, but God said, hey, <laughs> Shabbat, I'm not going to let the sun set. I'm going to let the first the Shabbat, the sun will stay up all night and all day, and it did. And then came uh, Sunday night, or Saturday night, sorry, Saturday night, and the sun set for the first time. And Adam and Eve were afraid. They thought it was the end of the world. No sun, no plants, nothing's gonna live. Oh my God, look what we've done. And God gave, well, it was Adam, but I'll add Adam and Eve, uh, two stones. One was darkness, and one was the valley of death. And they rubbed those two stones. He taught Adam and Eve to rub those two stones together and make light. And they made light. They made fire. God gave the gift of fire. Uh, and it got them through the night. Um, and that is the light of the Havdalah candle. That's where we get the Havdalah candle. So, as bad as we think it may be, we just take those two stones, rub them together, and we will make light. <laughs> so, you know, being um, um, sort of being in the trenches, um, meaning serving community day in and day out, and you know, being present. Uh, there are two things that I have seen in this this year and of course COVID has impacted its um, you know its influence on us of course there is such thing uh, as well as of course October 7th so yes there is um, um, in the last number of years privatization of the Jewish ritual we hear bar and bat mitzvah done very sweetly in the backyard without presence of the community necessary but family and so forth uh, baby namings, Ryan, Rabbi Ryan and I ask very often, would you please come to our house and officiate at, uh, you know, welcome, and this is not a brit milah, it is, uh, you know, another sort of a, a form of the uh, uh, celebration as well of, receive, of receiving an, uh, a child. But we're also seeing in the life of Darhei Noam, and those of you who are regulars here on Saturday, we've been having one baby naming after another. We have Parnasim here who are, who are uh, able to validate this. Uh, we people are bringing us babes, you know, and very happy to come. And you see them, you see this new wave. Our B'nai Mitzvah class has never been bigger than the last year. Yes, it was had to do with some uh, COVID influence, uh, on us and some are weighted and so forth, so we had exceptional class. But we also see a certain hunger in, um, and families of interface, uh, uh, from, from an interface background. But not only this, we also see Jewish people themselves who had very little background. It, it is their children who say, well, but 
Shlomi is having his bar mitzvah, and I want mine, and nobody knows how much you need to prepare, but it doesn't matter. The fact that Shlomi shown the way, and the little Jacob decided that that's also what he wants, and it's up to us to make it possible. So I want to say, in a hopeful sense, I'm being, as I said, you know, in and out of a trench, in the garden and back, in, a, in this a wrestle, is that there's plenty of hope. Uh, for Darchei Noam and uh, communities uh, as such. And it, a lot has to do with what we do and how we do it. So there is, the, and I want to say that since October 7th, I've received more phone calls about conversion and more people said to me, my Judaism has never been stronger. And there's the same people who say, I bleed for innocent, innocent people of Gaza. It's not, the heart is wide enough to handle both pains. It's not either or. Since when are we so unsophisticated? So this is what I want to say when I hear Dennis, your voice, and uh, Sandy, your voice here on the Bima, and in this community, um, I realize how much I missed you. <laughs> and how much I missed my parents and my life in Indiana that is sort of um, Ambered in this in this very important formative stage, but to be able to bring you, bring you and share this experience, uh, and hear your teaching and share community, and it is so incredibly in, invaluable. Your scholarship, your influence, and in general community, particularly in the Jewish community, and allow us to wrestle and to re. Uh, focus ourselves has been absolutely invaluable. And the treasure from Indianapolis, Indiana, and my treasure of, uh, of Darche Noam could meet. And that is an incredible sense of uh, accomplishment for all of us here. I would also like to thank um, Suzanne and Marty and Moses for your gift of generosity that every year Elka Klein of blessed memory is held dear and her memory shines and our intellect holds her and our feeling for you and for the family is present. So, um, Sandy. <laughs> Carol will follow me by uh, thanking extraordinary committee. This was not easy, was not hard to get a committee going. <laughs> there were people were so excited. So Dennis and Sandy, I have something little for you from Darhe Noam. So if you can both just come up, and I will explain. I know my the bag is very uh, uh, very pink. Uh, just in case you didn't know, it tells you that what is it Barbie movie, right? They're like and you see pink everywhere now, right? It's actually a kind of a amazing color. So we, Darhe Noam is filled with very creative people. Yes. And not only, but intellectuals, for sure. Degrees, you can wallpaper whatever little walls we have here, but actually all of our walls, very clever. But also people who create things with their hands with profound um, artistic sensibility. So what we have here uh, for you is, uh, first of all, a beautiful little hamsa made by Joel Troster to, uh, to, 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 to protect you and keep you till you come back and further <laughs> to Darche Noah. That's you. number one. And also, again, uh, Joel created our member this hollow board. I love it. And um, we put um, about a year and a half ago, and so we put our logo on mm. it. So. Uh, it, it, and it has little legs, mm. which were, is very nice. Did everyone see that? I love little leg because it elevates. It's very important. Does it have a battery and it <laughs> works? <laughs> but I just love these little feet, you know? They're just, uh, they're like lifts the board. It's very lovely on the table. So for your Shabbat table, thank you, thank you so uh, for you truly created a shulchan or for oh, all of you. us. So thank I just want to so say it has been a pleasure and and deepening experience of our Jewish life. <laughs> Thank you. May I be allowed one more word? One oh more word, more, God. two. <laughs> Yesterday's Torah portion had so many, so much in it that we couldn't cover everything. But um, there was a moment in the Torah portion 
where the term komimiut was used, the only time it is used in the Torah, among the blessings, uh, God says to the people, va'olech komimiut, I will guide you komimiut. The word reappears in the Ahava Rabbah prayer that we say in the morning, right before we recite the Shema. It says, Vatolicheinu komemiut learzeinu. The word komemiut means standing upright in a sense of trust and confidence. And I think that for Sandy and for me, that has captured the meaning of this weekend, this synagogue your leadership, that uh, this is a congregation and a Jewish community that stands komimiut, that stands ready to, to, to walk into the future. And uh, despite the challenges that we face and have historically faced as Jews, yesh tikva, there is hope. And uh, one thing a Jew never gives up, uh, Eschel said, is in about hope. So we look forward, hopefully, to coming together in the future and uh, to continue to hear from uh, 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 your rabbi wonderful things about the congregation and uh, to, to staying in touch. This has been a wonderful experience for us and we are grateful and we are honored to deliver the Elka Klein lecture as a closing moment in our presence with you. Thank you. It's a little bit sad for me that this wonderful weekend is soon to conclude and not before our desserts. Just desserts? <laughs> <laughs> we thanked a lot of people. Surprisingly, there's still a few more to thank, but I just wanted to enlighten my rabbis. It's still a question how you call four rabbis who you work with on a committee, rabbi, 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 and rabbi. Um, but um, I, I've, my own way of thinking is that there's two kinds of emergencies. One is a health emergency, and another emergency is when you have a very brief or a little possibility to make something good happen, and you just have a little window, a little possibility of making that happen, and a group of people saw that window together. I'm speaking of our rabbis, I'm speaking of the Sassos, Rabbi Dennis, Rabbi Sandy, and I'm speaking, if you wouldn't mind to stand up, it's very emotional, of our wonderful committee who has been in equal parts friend, ally, and brilliant in each in their own way, and Jan, Linda, um, Suzanne, if you wouldn't mind to stand up, Walt, we'll be together one more time. Aggie, Don, this has been, if you can imagine this working group together, it's just been a pleasure, an absolute pleasure. Thank you, thank you. I, I have been thanked, I've been duly thanked, I've never been so thanked. A, f a few people who have not been adequately thanked. We wouldn't be meeting here tonight if not for the grace of the Nostalgia Committee who were kind enough to give up their plans to use the building this evening. With grace and generosity, Sarah, you handled that and made the way possible for us to move forward. Thank you and thank you. Um, people have come at the last minute, not the least of our security, but. Uh, but um, other people have risen up in the last minute to fulfill roles. And uh, you know who you are, um, Ryan, uh, David at the door, Carla. Um, in particular, I'd like to mention Kathy Sikora on the Zoom, who had very much wanted to be here in person. Our president, Sylvia, who's emailed with me generously over the last few days. I need to thank again, there's no end of thanking Suzanne and Marty for bringing a, uh, and Moses too, for bringing us together in this moment. It's extremely affecting to me that the congregation rises up like this. 
And uh, I asked Aggie, what's the word for that? When a congregation like, you know, like rises up and people come out of the woodwork and David Lefkowitz and Danny with the history. And, and she said, this was the right expression. Excuse my butchering the Hebrew. Kol Yisrael aradin zelazeh. And she said that in our congregation, we've risen up to take care of each other, it's to come together, to give the Sassos a homecoming and to have a spiritually uplifting weekend. Thank you all so much. Um, Maya, I think you were saying today, it was, if not, please, I just want to make sure you handled questions uh, so well. We are going to go downstairs and enjoy um, ourselves. I just want to also say to our Zoom people that we're about 40 households on. So uh, thank you, means tremendous. And uh, join us downstairs and let's continue to dream. <laughs>